Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, we're talking about whales, robots, and you, how technology may change what you think of as a person. And it's not me giving the main lecture, but Heather Graves. I just wanted to tell you something, I think you'll find it a little bit amusing about my own relationship to things in this area. That has to do with the course and my plans to get a pair of octopus. I was gonna get two octopuses and come and tell the class how it was going with you know, the octopuses. This was my plan. Why haven't I done it yet? Well, I think the octopuses would outsmart me at the moment. I need to, to get a little bit better in terms of preparing for them coming into my life. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the reasons that I think that. So the remarkable story, cephalopods, octopus, cuttlefish, and squid. They're remarkably beautiful, and they can do many things with their bodies that you can't at all do with your, yours. They have no bones, and so the hardest thing in their body is the eye. And they can, they can squinch the rest of their body up to go through incredible small spaces and cracks as long as the eye will fit through. So you can imagine how tiny, and they're very, very clever. Now a lot of the writing, we're gonna to talk today about writing, a lot of the writing about the, the octopus asks what I think is a kind of a stupid question, why are they so smart? Why do they need to be smart? They only live one to five years, they don't do anything all that, that exciting, why are they as intelligent as they are? Well, I think it, it's enjoyable to have, you know, a, a rich intellectual life, all of you feel that. So even if you don't have that much to do with your you know, intellect, it's still fun. And they also do, do engage in play. They, they do things that are very much like play and having fun and having toys and all, all this kind of thing. So I'm not sure it's such a valid question of how they got to be so smart or whether they are smarter than they need to be. They exhibit personality. There's considerable diversity amongst them. So there are 13 of you in the room at the moment. If there were 13 octopuses, and if they were presented with some sort of challenge or stimuli, their reaction would be as varied as the 13 of you would be to something. So they, they indeed have personalities, different ways of coping with things. They can engage in amazing color and shape changes. They can fit into the background, even a very heterogeneous visual background. They, they can create a pattern on their bodies that fits in so you can't see them against that uh, heterogeneous background. They can engage in problem so solving and one of their big problems is getting stuff to eat, right? So if they're in the tank, let us call this the octopus tank, and there are other tanks around with other kinds of fish. During the night, they will find a way to get out of their tank, go into the other tanks, eat the fish in the other tanks, and then they, they know that they're supposed to be in their tank, so they go back to their tank. And in the morning, they say, what, me? I have no idea where those fish went. Ha! Prove that I had something to do with the, 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 the absence of the fish that used to be in those other tanks. So. Um, and uh, even if their tentacles or arms are severed from the body, there's still considerable intellect in each of the tentacles. So a severed tentacle can still grasp things, can move something useful like a piece of food to where you know, the mouth would be if indeed that uh, was still a part of um, uh, the octopus. So, I think the way to look at it is your intelligence is much more centralized in your head. They, they have three hearts and they have like brain, little parts of their brain all over the body. And it's just a different way to kind of, you know, approach the challenges of life. So who's smarter, us or them? Well, I can only tell you I haven't dared to purchase them yet because I think probably make a 
a chaotic mess of my life. So at the moment, I think they're a little bit smarter than I am. And, and when, when I think I, I'm up to the challenge, then I'll buy some and tell you what it's like having them as pets. So really, that, that's all I had to say um, today. And so we'll now switch over to. Hello. Nice to meet you all. I'm Heather Graves. I'm a professor in the Department of English and Film Studies, but I do not teach the anal analysis of literature. I teach writing and rhetoric. So uh, I don't do a lot of standing up in front of people and talking. I do a lot of talking very briefly and then giving people writing assignments to practice in class. So lecturing is not my strong suit, but I'll do the best I can here to uh, talk about interesting things today. I'm going to talk about, raise some questions, I guess, about whales, robots, and you. How technology may change what you think of as a, a person. So this is a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. Ma mainly, I'm going to start with what is technology, because I teach academic writing at U of A. And generally, the traditional opening is, OK, let's define our terms first, and then we can go from there. So I thought that's a good way to start. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how writing is a technology, because a lot of people don't really think of it as a technology anymore, because we've been writing for several thousand years now. So it seems like, oh yeah, pretty standard. I'm going to talk a little bit about how writing changes or shapes reality, how we can change our reality through our writing. Uh, and also then about how writing is related to the creation and maintenance of knowledge by humanity. And then I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit and talk about uh, how our relationship to technology and animals may change um, as we know, learn more and more about our world around us and about animals and our machines. So first of all, what is technology? This is from dictionary.com. This is how they define it, which is the branch of knowledge um, that deals with the creation and use of technical means, so the things that we create and how they're interrelated with life, society, and the environment. So how do we develop our technology, and how does it relate to the things around us? And it really draws on uh, mainly on industrial arts, engineering, applied science, and pure science. So I got to thinking about, so what is the point of technology? Why are we like relentlessly moving ahead with new versions of iPads and telephones and things like that? What, what is the ultimate goal here? And it seems to me that. One of our main goals is we're trying to improve the quality of our lives. So for people who have disabilities, some of our technology is geared towards um, improving their ability to function or to enjoy their lives. I think we're also attempting to advance our human civilization, at least um, Western and contemporary civilization. I think it's true of, that, of our group anyways. Uh, I think we're also using technology to try to learn more, to increase our knowledge of the world around us, so biological and natural systems, also of ourselves as part of that. Uh, I think there's probably some other uh, reasons, or the goal of our technology, in addition to these, but I was focusing mainly on those. You know, not to say that all of our technology is fabulous and everything works out. I think that some of our technology has decidedly negative effects. Um, the unmanned drones that the US are using for warfare is great for military personnel. It's not so great for the people who are under the bombs when they drop. Uh, we've used a lot of technology to get the oil out of the oil sands in northern Alberta. And we're using developing technology to do that more s safely, I guess, and more economically. Um, and I also, then I saw this picture of uh, Hello Kitty Pink AK-47, and I thought, you know, enough said about that. There are definite downsides. So, writing is a technology. So, in what way is writing a tool or a technology? Good question. How is it? Anyone want to proffer an answer? How do we use writing as a tool? As a student, what do you do with writing? It, um, it sort of facilitates our quality of life by being able to communicate with other people in a more effective level. Good. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how I see writing as a technology. A lot of people don't really think of it as a technology. Um, they think of it more as a way that you can record your thoughts. It kind of Your thoughts go from your head straight down onto the paper, and it's pretty transparent. Uh, the ways that we talk about writing, you know, scientists talk about writing up their results from a, an experiment as if it's all in their head and they just get it down there and they'll be good. Um, doctors, they'll write up a patient's chart and it, it all seems pretty straightforward. But when we use terms like that, we're really characterizing writing as if it's just an assist to real work. It's not the work itself, but you know, if you've written, ever tried to write a paper for a class, then you know that there's a lot of real work goes, that goes on there when you try to write anything. Uh, it's actually hard work. Um, and so it, I think some of the ways that we used to talk about writing does the people who use the language a disservice because they think, oh, this, is, this should be way easier than it is. Why is it so hard? Well, there's a lot of answers to that, but I'm not going to get into that right now because that's not so relevant. However, if you show up in one of my writing classes, then you'll hear what I think about why writing's hard to learn how to do. I'm going to go into a little history here about the history of writing. Um, preceding our current alphabetic written language, we had pre-alphabetic syllabic writing. Um, and what it tried to represent was what people heard when they spoke the language. So it was kind of like reflecting the language itself. The problem with these pre-syllabic uh, types of uh, alphabets were that, or writing systems were that you couldn't really think unique thoughts. They weren't conducive to thinking in complex ways. And a lot of them were used for like keeping records of how many barrels of grain did we harvest this year, how many uh, barrels of wine do we have in store. So a lot of the bookkeepers and the um, supplies maintenance people in, uh, I think it was like a probably about 3,000 years ago. They were um, using these systems in order to record things and keep records, but they weren't particularly um, useful for the ordinary person to use. They couldn't really use them. And not everyone could read either. These, these were specialized so that you only had particular people in a culture who could use these languages. So one of the Greeks' big contributions was a sub syllabic alphabet or uh, alf alphabetic writing system, is what I'm trying to say. And one of the things that they did was come up with the phoneme, which is the smallest meaningful um, unit of speech. And it really, they really consist of consonants, but you can't say a consonant. You always have to attach a vowel to it, so it gives you a vowel and consonant together. And this provides an abstract way of reflecting language so that you can um, use it to, do, to um, write down and remember more complex thoughts than, uh, than the pr previous systems that were in use. So it really enabled literacy and broad scale literacy too. So writing's been used, well, almost ever since for all kinds of things, but a lot of preservation of knowledge humans have used it for. Uh, for example, in medicine, a lot of the uh, different cultures, medical knowledge was recorded in writing and the books were handed down. Um, so we have texts written in Egyptian, Hebrew, ancient Indian languages, Greece, Rome, Islamic cultures as well. They all preserve their medical knowledge through written texts and they also use those written texts, of course, to pass the knowledge along to new generations. So in the medieval period, um, a lot of university students learned medicine from studying Greek and Islamic texts. Interestingly, medicine in that period was taught mostly through lecture and disputation, so um, constructed debates and arguments about things, um, supplemented and um, through a smaller amount with practice and with apprenticeship and a little bit of uh, dissection. Interestingly enough, not all faculties of medicine in the medieval period even used surgery as a way to train people. It was mostly the literate um, written knowledge that they were imparting, not so much the practical knowledge. Now, I want to take a look here at, this is a piece of um, 
16th century medical knowledge. Uh, it, this is a diagram by Vesalius. He was um, dissected nine women in order to um, represent the organs that he saw in the woman's body and how the blood vessels were related. And this is actually a really interesting picture because what it does is reflects the theory of the time rather than what he was actually looking at when he um, uh, was examining the women that he cut open. And what you'll see is that um, if you look at it, the vessel that feeds the left ovary, so that's E, the purple box, it originates in the renal artery, which is the artery that goes to the kidney, that carries uncleansed blood to that ovary. Well, the right ovary is fed from the cleansed blood of the dorsal artery, which is the green box. So uh, what he was trying to depict here is the Aristotelian um, piece of fact of knowledge that women were inferior to men because they were produced by the left ovary, which was fed with uncleansed blood, and the right ovary produced men who were naturally pure and uh, better than women. So the, interest, the reason I'm talking about this is the fact that you know, he could look at the cadavers and he could draw what he thought, what he was supposed to see rather than what he did see, because the knowledge that had been recorded and codified and handed along was such that it had to, ideologically, it had to advance the position that um, was considered to be factually scientific at that point in history. So the point I'm trying to make is that writing can play a role in creating ideology. So when we write ideas down, they become knowledge. And they become a permanent record of ideas. And sometimes they're correct, sometimes they're incorrect. Generally, they're regarded as being you know, the best knowledge we have at this time. More study will revise these. But sometimes it can take a, whole, a long time before uh, scientific facts become revised in order to re better reflect what's actually there. So cultural his culture, history, tradition, convention, they can all turn ideas to stone so that even reality can't dislodge them. So it took about 2,000 years before Aristotle's science or ideology of human anatomy before it was actually discredited. That's a long time. The next thing I'm going to take a look at is um, this research by Patty Kelly. This is from an article called A Rhetorical Analysis of Premenstrual Dysphoric Disorder, or PMDD, in Canadian newspapers. So what she was looking at was um, the way newspapers covered this um, controversy that was going on in, um, with uh, psychological disorders in Canada between 1986 and 2007. So she looked at 64 articles in 20 different newspapers over 21 years. And so what she found was that before 1986, the disorder of PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, was, wasn't even mentioned in the newspapers. But in 1986, it was proposed for inclusion in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, so that's DSM-3R, uh, which is the um, Psychological Association's Diagnostic Tool and Classification System for Mental Health Professionals. So at that point, um, there was a controversy over whether this should be listed in the DSM um, at that time, and eventually it was decided to include it in the, the appendix of that volume because there wasn't the, there was some evidence or weak evidence that it actually existed. But then a few years later, in 1994, when the next version of the DSM was published, um, the premenstrual dysphoric disorder appeared not only in the appendix, but then it also moved into the main text of the book under depressive order disorder not otherwise specified. So the key thing here is that an insurance code was attached to it at that point. And then as soon as you could bill for it, um, doctors could bill for it, then it starts becoming d diagnosed because it's actually a treatable disease. So the, the point that um, Patty Kelly makes is that 
the, this disorder was placed within the book, even though the subcommittee that eventually decided to put it there had concluded that there was very little empirical evidence to support that it should be included, but it was anyways. So given that is the context that she's working with, she wanted to look at, Kelly wanted to look at, so how is this mental illness constructed for newspaper audiences? Because newspapers pick up what's going on in the scientific world and they work with it and then they present it to the general public. She was also looking at how, how does the newspaper accommodations of expert language affect how women are represented who are di diagnosed with PMDD. So what she found was that while this, the manual, because it, well, it serves as a series of classifications, everyone assumes that it's based on empirical observations and scientific evidence, so if a disorder appears in there, they assume that it's going to have some scientific um, evidence behind it to justify it being uh, included there. So what she was doing then looked at how once it was in the newspaper, or once it was in the manual, how it became linked to discussions within the newspapers. And what she found was that um, the newspaper started to adopt this language so that whenever they referred to um, situations in which premenstrual symptoms were relevant, it became indicative of a pathological state. So any woman with premenstrual symptoms becomes in some way mentally disordered. So it's no longer a natural, natural conditions, it kind of a, indicates an un, unbalanced condition. So what Kelly concludes is that the, although the DSM is intended for professionals who work in the field of psychiatry, it doesn't, all that knowledge and those judgments don't stay there, they bleed over into the larger population. So the newspapers pick up the language, it becomes applied to people, and it becomes part of the way people understand and think about concepts that, you know, at one time, it was an, um, premenstrual symptoms are supposedly normal, but they become pathologized in association because the newspaper doesn't distinguish between the academic knowledge that is behind the, um, the diagnosis and uh, how they understand it. So in this particular case, the, right, the right, writing down, including of this um, disorder in the manual, it's not just recording its existence, it's, it's also cha shapes and changes the reality that goes along with it. So there are additional implications for the power that writing has. Um, writing allows complex thought. Uh, Walter Ong is responsible for arguing that position. Writing also tends to be the basis for human knowledge, so we use it as a way to generate knowledge. We also use it as a way to preserve it and to, sh for, to share it across generations. The other key point, I think, is that um, in our society, the 21st century is being called a knowledge economy, so it's based on the widespread education and dissemina dissemination of knowledge, and a lot of this is based on writing. And I think that uh, in this economy, writing is ending up being one of the technologies that's going to enable your personal success as educated professionals. So it's become more important for people to learn how to write well uh, in this generation than in previous generations. So I'm seeing um, 21st century advances in knowledge um, as we increase increase in our knowledge of things, we develop better technology, it leads to more sophisticated um, advances. And in turn, the technology that we generate allows us to learn more as well, so we understand things better than we did before. I think there's kind of a synergy or a symbiosis among knowledge and technology, but at the same time, as we make advances in knowledge and we produce more sophisticated technology, I think it also raises important ethical and philosophical questions. And I think ultimately it's going to require us to rethink our relationships to nature and technology. At least that's what I'm going to talk about next. So I want you to take five minutes now and hopefully the, uh, one of these questions appeals to you in some ways. Take five minutes and just write an answer to one of these questions or an answer to all of them if you don't have a lot of... Uh, 
to say about any one particular one. Just see where it takes you. I want you to think a little bit about potential answers to these questions. So what's our current relationship to technology? When our technology is smarter than we are, how does that change our relationship to it? Should or could machines have rights similar to human rights? And what circumstances would be, make it possible that machines might have rights? Um, yeah, so I answered to the first question, what is our current relationship to technology? And uh, what I've said is that uh, technology is used currently to, faci to facilitate our relationship with the world around us, whether it be through social means, scientific means, or medical. We can currently relate to the world in a much larger scope and communicate to people we have previously been unable to. It has also changed the way we communicate by making our communication more visual in some forms and increasing the frequency at which we communicate in others. Good. Yeah, um, that's also the first question. Yeah, uh, I think my relationship to technology is that I use technology to make my life more easy. Uh, I choose what I want from technology and I'm the main one who just controlled this relationship. And when I feel that technology controls me, I'm gonna throw away everything. So I'm the main one who controls the relationship. Um, and, then, and also I depend on technology. And again, if this technology is like, like overwhelm me, I'm gonna just leave it alone. I'm the main one who controls the relationship. That's it. Good, thank you. <laughs> I kind of looked at the last two questions. I, what I thought of is what measure of intelligence machines will really have, and we always kind of compare them of, oh, when they're you know humans and smarter, who says they're going to think of innate things like you know, oh, I, I need these rights, where you know you can just be really intelligent and still just not have a care or meaning for rights. I mean. It could just be that they're much faster at processing, can solve all these problems, and you know all these classical definitions of intelligence, but they don't have the social construct or necessities of you know humans. So, I, I for circumstances that may lead to machines having rights, I wonder if you know maybe it's not even something they would ever desire. But I don't know. It's an interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Good points. kind of answered the first one here. Most of our technology is based upon our economy and what people will pay for it. If people don't pay for it, then it's not created. So despite it might have a, a great use, but if, like for example, no oil company or some big buyer is backing it, then the technology will never be produced. Yeah, that's a good point or alternate fueled cars is one of them. They, they were, they've been trying to develop those for like decades and decades, but until recently, it wasn't going anywhere. I wrote something about the second question, that when our technology is smarter than we are, we will be asked to serve their needs, or they will destroy us. We, we would help to maintain uh, their, their energy and to enlarge their lifespan. And we, might, uh, we, we must be, feed their needs. And uh, if, if the machine uh, comes to be smarter at the, that level that the, they can do it by themselves, we, we might be expelled to the jungle and live in the wild as all the other <laughs> animals are doing now. <laughs> so, True. <laughs> yes, that depends on whether they need us to be, coexist in this planet and more. Yeah, that's Thank true. You. Good points. Mm -hmm.
I will add something else. It might be um, about um, smarter machines uh, than human beings. It might cause some uh, changing the status of the common law, um, giving them, um, instead of legal persons, I mean defining them as legal persons, life, uh, 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 right, instead of uh, legal um, things. So changing them from things to yeah. persons and uh, defining new laws for them, what kind of right they have. And I think it changes the uh, definition of so many standards that we have, like morality, like our experiments and all these things. Are we going to do the same experiments on a smarter machine than us? Are, are we going to send, send them to Mars? Will they agree to do that? Um, I think it will change everything. Yeah, it could change what we think of as our lives think, significantly. That's true. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit here about um, current technology, I suppose. Um, the question a few years ago used to be whether, um, in, in connection with the Turing test, whether what you're talking to online was a human or a machine. So the Turing test being the test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior indistinguishable from a human. And this comes from Alan Turing first raising this question in his essay, um, Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And uh, one of the most popular programs, um, ELISA, it combines databases of language with rules for forming intelligent sentences. And the image there is an excerpt from someone's conversation with ELISA. Um, so the issue here is, you know, can the human distinguish who they're talking to? Is it a machine or is it a computer? Um, but I think um, these questions are changing over time. Um, for example, now we're, we're asking questions about whether uh, humans are being aided by computers to cheat at things. And most recently, um, this young man was suspected of cheating in a chess tournament in December. Uh, the organizers became suspicious because he was doing too well. Um, he would, had never won a tournament, and his ranking or his rating was uh, 2,200. And suddenly, he was beating grandmasters, and his rating ended up. He won the tournament, and his rating ended up being in excess of 2,600. So they thought that he must be getting help somehow. So they searched him. Uh, made him take off some of his clothes to see whether he had like a link or a device or something that was helping him to cheat. But they couldn't find anything. So that's been highly controversial. But it uh, raises the whole issue of a kind of reverse Turing test where is it the human or the machine? So I looked a little bit at, uh, so how would you detect fraud in games of chess? Because computers can play games of chess now, so can you distinguish between human play and um, computer play? And the way that this would be done, apparently, I don't think there is, uh, no one's actually come up with this algorithm yet, but it would need to be a move analysis test that would um, differentiate the style of play, whether it's a human or whether it's a computer. And there's several ways that um, they, they could approach this kind of thing, which is to analyze the moves against past history of all games. So um, look at a person's um, various choices of moves throughout the game and um, checking it against past history. If only 2% of humans would make this move, yet 50% of com computers would make it, then it looks as if um, it's more likely that a computer is playing that particular game. Another way to approach it is something like looking at how human, the moves that humans are likely to make versus the um, moves that computers are likely to make in order to try to detect changes in play that indicate there's possible cheating there. Uh, the other, um, I think that an even more um, current issue with 
trying to detect cheating is through the, all the online poker that um, is being developed. And there's a lot, the companies that are running them have to um, figure out ways to detect fraud and collusion. So how do you do that? Uh, and there's various ways. So fraud is uh, somebody steals someone else's password and then they start playing and they play really badly so that they lose the money out of the person's account as quickly as possible. They lose it to a particular person so the money goes into their account and then they can clean it out later. Collusion, they define as two or more players managing their play or um, like n not betting the way they should with the hand that they've got in order to go easy on another player or else to allow a particular player to win. So it's people um, collaborating in order to manage the, way, the outcome of the game. So both of those things are important to catch if you're playing online poker because that will affect people's experience of the game if you get cheated, definitely. Uh, so they want, uh, they need to be able to catch people who are doing that. So, so really what they're doing now is developing computers that can tell if you're cheating or not. And there's some interesting ways they're doing that. Uh, one strategy is to analyze the play after the fact and um, detect, to detect fraudulent play and then um, reimburse the person who is defrauded. But there's significant costs associated with that, of course. So the more cutting edge approach is to try to create programs that follow and analyze the play second by second in order to detect unfavorable or uncharacteristic play strategies. So um, the, com the computer will kind of document the way a person plays, the, how conservative they are, the kinds of um, hands that they tend to um, bet highly on. And then as soon as the play changes so that they're doing something that's not characteristic of them, they can automatically lock the account down to check out and make sure that, um, that, it's, that no fraudulent uh, play is going on. So that seems interesting to me as well. So the, the question is now no longer can the human detect the computer, it's can the computer detect the human. So it's really, ch things are changing. And now of course recently, um, Japanese robotics um, engineers have developed some robots who look quite human and they're actually selling them so that you can buy a robot to do your housework or to act as your companion which seems sort of strange, but I know in science fiction this has been a really favorable uh, topic in, in, in a number of books, including The Wind-Up Girl, um, where extrapolating from these human-like robots um, that come to the point of being sentient but aren't really considered by the human culture as being human. And so what are the implications of that whole issue? So, you know, as long as long as they're fairly rudimentary robots, I'd think that most people see them as machines. But there is a point at which you can conceive of them crossing over into um, being a lot more human-like. So, which raises for me the question of, well, what separates humans from machines or from animals? And uh, uh, philosophers have tried to identify what are the, what's the difference between humans the human animal and other types of animals. And this is a list of some of the things that have been, been identified. So our ability to communicate, our ability to have language, which includes writing, our ability to reason, so think through and solve problems, our consciousness and self-awareness are another thing that um, philosophers say separates us, our ability to distinguish morality separates as well, and, and also our development and preservation of tools, so machines, but also our development and present preservation of knowledge. So we pass these, our use of tools along from generation to generation. That's how we can become s smarter and uh, more skilled. So those are some of the basic markers that distinguish humans from animals. Um, and there, this is from a discussion Lori Marino is a neurobiologist at Emory University, University in the U.S. She notes that humans are considered persons because they have a certain set of characteristics. 
So they're self-aware, intelligent, complex, autonomous, cultured, and so on, which is, there's some overlap there between the list that I just generated and the one that she's making here. She says that if we accept this, genera this definition, and ver versions of this are used around the world in constitutions and other legislations, so there's precedent for using these as criteria to develop, to determine humanity, or then the latest science is also telling us that cetaceans or whales also qualify as humans or persons, which is a really interesting idea. So this is a summary of some of the latest research about whales. So apparently whales have distinct cultures. Every clan is unique, so they have different feeding and migration patterns. They have different child care preferences. Their rates of reproduction differ from um, whale pod to whale pod. Each clan also speaks its own dialect, and that's one way that they identify who's part of the clan and who isn't. The dialects are learned, they're not genetic, and they also persist through time, so they're handed down from one generation to the next. And the whales that grow up in a particular clan can speak to each other, and they can recognize other whales that are not relatives of theirs. Uh, Hal Whitehead is a biologist at Dalhousie University who studies whales from a boat rather than tracking them through technology. He says that if humans break up a group of whales, they're destroying an ancient living culture. So there's a lot of um, elements there that qualify in the definition of humanity. Apparently, whale brains are also really highly developed. So they're really different from other mammals' brains, especially land mammals. This is a picture. It's a cartoon picture, but it's what it's trying to represent is not only the difference in size, but apparently the number of convolutions in the brain are directly related to intelligence. And what they found is that the whale brain is even more convoluted than the human brain, which means that whales are in some ways smarter, but it's a different kind of intelligence than, than humans have. So that, um, Marino says that um, whales are an alternative evolutionary route to complex intelligence. They have a really well-developed limbic system, which is the part of your brain that processes emotions. They have actually a paralimbic lobe that um, is an add-on, really, to the limbic lobe that actually protrudes into the cortex of the brain, So, um, which means that their ability to process emotions is, is extraordinary, I suppose. So what this suggests, though, is that whales combine emotional and cognitive thinking, which has led to sophisticated social communication and self-awareness. So they really, they communicate, they use their brains in ways that are different than humans. And uh, whale scientists are concluding that whales are more socially connected, more communicative, and coordinated than humans. So they actually exceed us in intelligence in some ways. This is another really interesting um, aspect. Uh, they use echolocation not just to locate food, or to, they also use it as a, a way of communicating. And Hal Whitehead says this is the world's most powerful imaging device. And he suggests that they use it as an ultrasound to see inside each other's bodies. So they can see what each other's eaten, they can see who's sick, they can see who's pregnant. So they've got a, a knowledge of each other that far exceeds what's possible for humans. So he's, so people working on this problem, they think that whales process this information and they can share it with, with each other. So they actually are um, communicating in ways that we can't really even imagine, I guess. So a widely dispersed whale, so as they're swimming around the ocean, they can form a single sensory loop in which they share information. So, and this research, led to, two years ago, an academic conference where the sci scientists, philosophers, a whole bunch of interdisciplinary groups came together to look at the latest whale science and talk about the possible, you know, is there a necessity for whales to have rights? So their um, position is stated here, this is from their website, uh, in spite of some forms of co conservation measures, cetaceans are currently treated as resources to be harvested, and yet many elements point in a different direction. 
So international law manifests a growing sense of duty to whales and dolphins. Contemporary ethical reflection brings new theoretical tools to bear on cetacean moral status. And scientific research gives us novel insights into the complexities of cetacean minds and societies. In light of this, scholars from the relevant disciplines drew together to spell out all the implications of such developments and to build a collective case for the attribution of basic moral and legal rights to cetaceans, great and small. So this was held in Helsinki, Finland, a couple of years ago. And at the end of the conference, they um, put together a declaration of the rights for cetaceans, which is uh, listed here at the bullet points. And um, it's quite interesting. So whales have the right to life. They shouldn't be held in captivity or servitude. They shouldn't be subject to cruel treatment or removed from their natural environment. They have the right to freedom of movement and residence within their natural environment. So they're not the property of any state, corporation, human group, or individual. They have right, the right that their, protect, their environment be protected, and so on. So that's kind of um, intriguing and arresting. So the next step, though, is that's just a declaration. It's not binding on anything. Um, it's really interesting to see scientific people come together and take a stand like that. But this project has now morphed into the Non-Human Rights Project, which um, they have a website called the Non-Human Rights Project, if you want more information. Um, and these are some uh, passages that I copied from their website, where they kind of outline what their goal, and their goal is and what they're uh, working towards. So they're, they're putting the issue in um, legal terms as you were talking about, with um, currently animals are, are legal things, they're not persons. So they possess no legal rights, and they don't have any hope of having them because they're invisible to judges, as long as they remain legally things. So the Non-Human Rights Project argues that some non-human animals should have the capacity to possess common law rights. And uh, what they're, so really what they're doing now is working towards um, changing the situation. They cite the great case in 1772 of James Somerset versus Charles Stewart. Um, Somerset sued Charles Stewart, claiming that he was not a, pos a possession, he was a human and he had rights. And so that basically overturned um, in British law the ability to keep human slaves. And from there, a lot of the rest of the Western world abolished slavery eventually, too. It took a little longer in the US because it was economically uh, feasible or economically desirable there. In other places like Canada, where it wasn't as economically useful, slavery was abolished a little faster. But there's a precedent there for changing the way that people um, understand, uh, I guess, things versus persons. So the Non-Human Rights Project, they have a legal working group, so, and they've identified five states in the US that may be receptive to the kinds of legal arguments that they want to make. They're currently, in the next month, I think they're going to identify a single state where they think they have the best chance, and then they're going to launch a lawsuit on behalf of some animals to challenge the status of some animals as things. So they're actually. Um, they're suggesting that chimpanzees, whales, elephants, and actually gray parrots should have uh, non-human rights. They should be judged to be um, not things, but legal persons. Because it's only legal persons that are entitled to have rights, such as bodily integrity and bodily freedom. So that brings us to some good questions, I think. So what are the implications of the non-human rights project? and say they do get a court decision that uh, grants a group of animals non-human rights, how will that, what potential does that have for altering our current reality? Well, one thing, not exactly an implication of the non-human rights project, but more an implication on it is, I wonder if we've, what studies we've done with these animals to uh, really, you know, maybe functional imaging studies of their brain or anything during tasks or something. What, what studies can we compare to measurements we have of our own sentience, of our own intelligence, so that we can actually 
compare and see because uh, like do we really understand what it is what brain processes it is that make us who we are deserving of rights and whatnot and do they cross over there so that that was one thing that come came to my mind is whether or not really they even if they seem to i mean what links do we have with them yeah that's a good question yeah because we don't understand ourselves all that well do we really On that, on that point, though, um, you know, just because we're one level or one type of intelligence, it doesn't mean that they don't exhibit a completely different intelligence that we don't understand. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So the often stated argument here is, is one of priorities, I guess, of uh, investigation. Uh, you know, man, many of these points are obviously valid, but given all the problems that exist in the world right, right now, do they rise to the top? You know, mm -hmm. I, are, is the plight of whales uh, above the, the the human problems of uh, Somalia, Rwanda? <laughs> you know where where you want to. And is that a stupid argument or is that the right argument? I don't know. It's always the same sort of simplistic thing. People compare the spending on. The small amount of spending on, you know, beneficial things with the spending on, you know, the military and so on, it, it becomes a kind of knee-jerk reaction. But how how do we figure this out? I mean, what do the students feel? How how important is this in your life? You know, would you be willing to to spend quite a lot of time to to improve the rights of uh, Whales, or is the pri priority of that for you really, really low? I, th I think it's just a question of resources. If, if, if someone can deem that there's enough resources in order to properly um, counter out the, the um, problems that are facing um, people in uh, the developed world um, who are, who are, being affected at the moment, then I, I don't see why there shouldn't be out resources allocated elsewhere, especially if people are willing to use those resources themselves and develop those resources. So you may have noticed this was the first day that I didn't bring the books. There are these four books that I keep offering to lo loan you guys. I didn't bring them today, but the book uh, Existence, David Brin's book that uh, Michael Woodside uh, talked about and uh, he has recently read and I have recently read. In there, there's the phenomenon of uh, uploading, uh, I mean, uh, of uh, upscaling uh, animal uh, intellect, bringing them up to, you know, a human level. and. How would we even decide whether they want this, or how would they know whether they want it? I mean, it's, it's like taking, you know, a retarded child and finding suddenly that there's the opportunity to give them normal uh, intellect. So do you ask the child? You know, how, how do you, how, and, and what would the priority for, the, for that be? If you think the quality of life is better, if you have greater uh, intellect, then should we be increasing the intellect of dogs, cats, you know? Where, 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 where does it end? I think that that's an even harder thing to figure out. Um, so any student thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely agree with the points. You know, it, before we start giving rights, we have to decide on rights and on what in intellectual abilities 
say my my cat Cork has. She's awful, by the way. But my cat has. So it, it's more important, I think, at this point, uh, rather than deciding how to give the rights or let's you know put effort into giving the rights. I feel it would be more important and more relevant to actually find what rights should be given or you know what's at what level of intellect someone or some animal needs to be in order to fully experience or appreciate these rights as opposed to you know let's all go right on ahead and get rights ready as opposed to find out what rights are deserved at first Um, I just have a bit of a side thought, I guess. Um, while we're looking at different examples of so-called humanity in um, other organisms, is that kind of related to our tendency to, say, personify things like our own pets? And um, is that just another case of us seeing what we're looking for, basically? Or is it we're learning something else? Well, I don't know. They're not really advocating human or like persons' rights for pets. They're really talking about, I think, for example, whales are, I think they're an alien life form that we just don't understand and we just have no idea about. The, and the more information we get about understanding just how sophisticated their level of life is and their, you know, their, there's not that huge a gulf, I think. So I think they're looking more at things like chimpanzees that people think it's okay to do testing on them but not on humans, right? When it looks as if they're very similar to humans and they have a sophisticated understanding of a lot of things that we're not, we haven't been aware of in the past. So I think they're, I think that the impetus here really is just to, to try to get outside of our own ethno or species, speciesist, I guess, that where we think that we're the pinnacle and that everything else is lesser than we are. So I think it, it's more trying to get people to recognize that than to, you know, that they, and I don't think they're looking at identical rights to what we have, but something commensurate with if we understand these groups, then, you know, what is it that we should be doing or not doing, like maybe we should just leave them all alone, right? Instead of putting them in SeaWorld or, you know, or having them in circuses and things like that. So I think it's more that's the issue rather than that, you know, we should all spend a lot of money, you know, setting up a nice environment for whales or something like that. It's like, let's just stop killing them and maybe, you know, that's not a bad place to start. On kind of on that topic, I, I always wonder, you know, the payoffs of it. Say, if by experimenting medicine on chimpanzees or something, if through X amount of tests we're allowed to save even just one human life, I, I wonder what balance we would find where you know this benefit to humanity is worth this amount of harm done to these other species, and especially as you're saying, it's, it's a lot different for chimpanzees or whales as opposed to our household pets because, you know, they're different levels of intellect. But I, I, I always wonder what kind of ground, middle ground everyone has on where the line is and for what amount of benefit should we be willing to pay what amount of price. Yeah, and that's a really good issue to raise. Uh, I was looking at some of the commentary around this whole um, discussion because it, it was new to me. I haven't really encountered it before. There's a lot of inf a lot of um, bandying back and forth of uh, addressing that question. That and one of the things that several people made w points they made was that in fact um, testing animal testing doesn't really tell us all that much about human beings because they're so different so we can test on animals and it looks like it doesn't kill that animal but then you give it to humans and it does kill them so the argument of the, the animal rights and the activists is that we're doing this we're fooling ourselves if we think that that is saving human lives because it, you, it's not it's not commensurate I guess but I don't know I haven't like looked at the science behind this. So that's just, was my looking at the emoting on the internet, right, in, in people's comments. But it would be worth looking at to see, okay, what is, are the statistics? What's the facts that, behind these statements?
but yeah, that's an important issue. So one, one of the odd things at the end, end of apartheid in uh, South Africa, um, in terms of the status of human beings, many very good things happened. But the uh, uh, primate uh, colonies in uh, South Africa, suddenly for about five years, it was possible to do research there that you couldn't do anywhere else in the world. Sort of under you know, the ra radar, people weren't thinking about you know, there's so much focus on, 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 on the rights of uh, human beings and the dramatic change in the, in the country they had just uh, undergone, that, that uh, researcher who, researchers who wanted to do, uh, you know, questionable primate uh, research found that they could do it there very, very easily. It was a really, uh, you know, bizarre sort of uh, episode. Um, all of this, of course, has important implications for robots when we get to machines that are as smart as we are. But we will have created those uh, machines. So in that respect, it's different, you know? It's not that they independently evolved. We created them, and then at some point they be became able to create and self-improve themselves and so on. But that, that will be a big difference. Uh, and there are many other differences. You know, with animals, no such thing as turning them off or, or unplugging them. Whereas <laughs> that's going to be, be a, the, the whole power thing. You, you can imagine that's something we accept now today. You know, many uh, technology advances have come that are amazing and wonderful, but you know, batteries really haven't kept up. So the, the whole power thing is pretty primitive at the moment. And you, you can imagine that that might change in a way that if you were a sentient robot, suddenly you wouldn't have to worry about power. Power is just everywhere. Power is in the air. Power is like breathing, you know? And, and you wouldn't have to worry about being uh, Unplugged, but there still are are issues of, you know, is your what part of your hardware is really you? If you are a robot and you have an identity, if somebody switches out your head, your arm, your this, you know, what is it that makes you you? We we have an idea for human beings what makes us uh, who we are. Um, but that may stop mattering when the, the you know, agenda of the world is being controlled by uh, machines much smarter than we are. Maybe every, every important idea in the world may have begun with, with a human being that had a particular name, but by the time it, it's enhanced and magnified by all the other machine uh, intellects, it may not really matter which uh, human being or what the name of that human being was. So the whole uh, identity thing could, could change. Are there other questions? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make one comment on the animal research thing. Um, I think um, on an organic level, um, there, there are some similarities, and unfortunately, there are, well, not unfortunately, but very fortunate for us in, in cardiology, for example, um, within the last 20 or 30 years, there's been some very large technological advancements in treating um, heart disease that wouldn't have been, wouldn't have happened without animal studies because that's actually how our system is designed. And for example, in the US, um, coronary stenting was not allowed in humans until 10 dogs had successfully survived um, the stenting process. And that happened a lot quicker in the north, actually, than in the south. So the north developed their stenting technology a lot quicker than the south did. Um, and it, I think those limitations in our system are part of why 
it, it occurs because because it's we don't have any choice at the moment, and, and unless these changes are made um, in the methodology of of how we perform our experiments, how we how we move on to human experiments, and whether a different a better model is created, then we're always going to be under the limitations of that. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Um, so I was just wondering about. Um, when you're making the argument about whales, um, you know, to just stop killing them and maybe that's a good starting place. Um, and looking at the list, I know there's also been a lot of research done with pigs and how they have a very complex social structure as well and, you know, you can measure stress levels and things like that in pigs as well. And so I think it's really encouraging that chimps are on the list because that's something where um, human progress and like things that we need to have in our lives have first been tested on chimps and if we're going to stop doing that then maybe we're sacrificing some of these things um, but in terms of the implications for agriculture business and things like that like I think it's maybe telling that pigs aren't on that list yet um, but just in terms of like future implications maybe it'll go more that way and I don't know if all of you tonight are just going to run out and have like a bacon sandwich after this um, maybe you're all vegetarians already um, but yeah, maybe that's another way that this will go in the future. Yeah. So we're uh, out of time. Thank you very much for a fascinating teaching session. You're welcome. Thank you.